I'm happy to introduce Dr. Tristan Kroll. Uh, he got his PhD at University of Melbourne and then did a, a stint at, Uni at Queensland's University of Technology in Australia. Since 2016, he's been at Cambridge Institute for Medical Research, working on a Soldi development. And I'm not going to go into very much detail about what a wonderful tool that is because he's about to tell us. So with that, uh, Tristan, would you like to take it away? Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. I will dive straight in and sort of get into, firstly, a, a tiny bit of background about why Isolde came to be um, and why, why I think it is important to, to be taking this approach and then get into some details of how it works and what you can do with it. So the basic problem here that, that anybody in experimental structural biology would know is that building models into low resolution density is hard and historically it's been very 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 hard. Um, if we put some numbers to that the worldwide Prating data bank contains well, uh, actually they, these are a month or two old now I'm sure it's probably more like 170,000 now structures with experimental data and um, some 36,000 of those are of worse resolution than two and a half angstroms and five and a half thousand or so resolutions worse than three and a half angstroms. And the problem is if we take that, um, say the three and a half to four and a half angstrom cohort and plot their quality as, as measured by the mole probability score, uh, a combination of uh, backbone, uh, side chain, outli geometry outliers and atomic clashes, and plot that against the fit to data on the x-axis, what we see is this essential mess with no, no correlation really anymore at all. And to give you an idea of the scale of the problems with, in some of these models, the mole probability score is a, a log two uh, base scale and the theoretical maximum score uh, corresponding to the worst possible model where everything is clashing and every single residue is both a Ramachandran and Rotoma outlier would be a little over six. And so some of these, some of these models at, uh, up, in, up in these top levels are uh, pumping on that door. So roughly half of all residues are in outlying space in, and very, very problematic. So there are some extremely problematic models out there, but there, there's also a lot of models that are mostly good with, with a handful of errors that uh, are still in their own way quite serious and how serious they are depends on what you want to do with the model. Um, but ultimately the real take home message from this one is that what this is telling us is that the existing crystallographic restraint schemes simply aren't dealing with this data well enough. We, the, um, there are too many wrong ways to fit the data that makes it hard to actually find the, the true right way that, that, that is actually physically meaningful. So what this older is about is, is taking molecular dynamics and turning it into a, into a tool for interactive model building. And why, why molecular dyna dynamics? Well, if we take your traditional crystallographic restraint libraries that, that have been used for, um, for interacting, interactive model building in the past, you're looking at something like this for the atom in purple here, where you've got three bonds to deal with, three angles, four torsion. So you've got 10 calculations to deal with. Problem here is that this atom and all the atoms here know nothing about the atoms that they're not actually bonded to. And what that, matter, what that means in practice is that if you have high resolution density that can tell you where every atom is, you, you have no real problem. This, will, this is enough to keep everything under control. But once you get to the, the sort of resolutions where your side chains start to disappear and that there, there simply isn't enough information in the map to tell, them, tell the atoms exactly where they need to be, you run into bigger and bigger problems where things just start sliding through each other and you end up with a, with a big tangled, frustrating mess. And people with uh, limited time, pressure to publish, need to, need to get these structures out. It's, it's entirely understandable how uh, errors remain. Molecular dynamics, on the other hand, explicitly models 
both your electrostatic interactions and van der Waals interactions for actually somewhat larger than this, a 15 angstrom shell is the standard in Isolde. So um, you'd, you'd be talking at least double the number of atoms that, 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 than what's shown here. So the problem here is that you've gone from that, those 10 calculations to at least two orders of magnitude more, um, a, a thou, the order of a thousand um, non-bonded interaction calculations to deal with. And that is computationally very, very expensive. And until the advent of the GPU era, would have been impossible to, to, to even consider doing interactively unless you had a $100 million supercomputer uh, in your backyard. But the advantage of doing this this way is that now when you interact with the model, it, it's like you're interacting with a real physical object, a real physical molecule that you've just been able to blow up to, to the size of something that you can, you can see. When you tug on an atom, the other atoms around it feel it and respond accordingly and they push back so that everything is always trying to settle to a physically realistic state as you interact with it. Um, so the design philosophy behind this older, so before I actually came to Cambridge to start on this older, I'd, I'd done um, an early prototype of the same general idea, but that was like most prototypes, fiddly to use, extremely hard to install, um, required a very, very specific environment. And so very, very few people were ever going to use it. So one of my big uh, um, goals in, in building is older was to make sure that it, it is as easy to install as possible for as many people as possible. So it, it which means that it runs on all three major operating systems and um, is a few clicks to install these days. Um, it should also have a reasonably gentle learning curve. I am still working on making that easier, I, I will admit. And, and to try and make things to, to show rather than tell as much as possible. Uh, and we'll, we'll see examples of how that goes. Uh, it should be flexible, so it is agnostic to your data source. It's designed to work as much as possible equally well for crystallographic or cryo-EM data and to adapt gracefully over a wide resolution range. So at the moment, I would say the sweet spot for working with Zolder or the, or the really the, the, the range of resolutions where it is tr quite straightforward to work with is roughly two at two to three and a half angstroms resolution. At, at higher resolutions than two angstroms, where you start to see um, alternate conformers, that's where Isolde can no longer help you. It, it can't handle alternate conformers at present. And molecular dynamics starts to become somewhat overkill at those resolutions anyway. At the other end, beyond three and a half angstroms, you still start to hit the point where you need extra external information. You can still work with Isolde out to any resolution you like, but you're going to start to need to use reference model, higher, higher resolution reference models to restrain things. And I, we'll see an example uh, of, of that uh, later. And it should be fast as much as possible. So the, the things I aim to, to get rid of, are uh, the situations where you just sit at, at one residue twiddling things to, to try and get a, a fit to the data when, when you can see where it needs to be and it should by right simply drop into place. You want it to just drop into, into place and, and settle for you. And a big one for me was to try and give as much real-time visual feedback of your model quality as possible to, to get rid of this cycle of build your model, refine your model, validate your model, find the outliers in a table, go find them in your model, try and fix them, and then refine and validate again to see how you did, is Zolder tries to show you how you're doing right now, all the time. And in particular, that, that's in, in the, the real-time Ramachandran and Rotom validation. We'll see in a bit. And it, the aim is to make it reasonably low cost, of course, GPU, it, it does rely on GPU computing, so it does require at least a fairly decent GPU. So it won't work on, it won't work very well, at least on your really bargain basement laptop computers. But a, a reasonably decent gaming computer is, is the, the target um, uh, uh, hardware for this, rather than the need for a, a, a high-end Quadro or Tesla, or, or in particular multiple Tesla GPUs, it, one single gaming GPU is, is 
what you need. Um, and another thing that I'm working on at is, is to make sure that it, it is extensible for people that do like uh, scripting and further development so people can add their own tools on top of Isolde as they need to. Um, so the general workflow of Isolde, the one thing I, I, I do need to make really clear up front because it has caught some people unawares where they've, they've downloaded it and started it on their particular model and hit the play button and then emailed me a few hours later saying, asking, when does it finish? Um, Isolde is not a fire and forget automated package. It is an interactive package that does what you tell it to do and finishes when you decide that it has finished. It is all designed around interactivity as an interactive model building tool. And there, there is the one go really golden rule of model building, which from looking at a, a, a very large number of models is not always followed, is that human eyes should see each residue in context with its density at least once. You, you need to be able to get in there and check it and check it to make sure that those automated tools that have done a wonderful job of building most of it to make sure that they've actually done the right job everywhere because the fact is they don't do the right job everywhere. There are always these residual errors that need to be fixed and it needs to be as easy as possible to go to those and fix them as, and fix them and, and get that final really high quality model. So your starting point for Isolde as it stands right now, it, with the version that's current, currently released, Isolde does not yet do actual building as in adding residues to your model. So you do need at least a preliminary model and a map, of course, or crystallographic structure factors. That model doesn't need to be very good. It, it can be still very high in errors. I mean, that, that's what this older is about, is, is fixing those as easily as possible, but it needs to be at least reasonably complete. Um, so for crystallography, you're talking a, a valid molecular replacement solution, for example, and ideally that's been extended by your favorite auto building package to get as much of it in place as you can. For cryo-EM, um, either an auto built model again or a, a reasonable homology model with as much of it as possible rigid body docked to the map, it doesn't, um, it, it can still be a long way out and there are tools to help you um, settle it the rest of the way. You need to have hydrogens present, but the good thing here is that if for most normal situations, the chimera X command at H does a good job for that very straightforwardly. And, and there, there's no, no further uh, problems needed, or fixes needed. Um, the, the main things you'll be doing with this older, it, it, can, it can simulate, I mean, very, very large models if you really want to. In, in one hit, I've, the largest I've, I've run is a, a two and a half angstrom crystal structure with two full ribosomes in the asymmetric unit. And that does run on my gaming laptop with a GTX 1070. But usually you don't want to be running your entire model. What, you, what you're doing is very small local simulations around the problem area just to fix that problem area while the rest of the model is just left alone. And that gives you both um, speed, um, so it gives you a, a uh, simulation that's small enough to be run at, at good interactive speeds. It also gives you peace of mind to make sure that you, you don't have to worry that you're doing strange things to your model elsewhere while you're focusing on this a little bit. Um, and it, uh, there are interact, interactive introductory tutorials available um, either by running the command this older tute there at the bottom or via a little menu at the top left of the older panel. So that both for both crystallographic and cryo-EM work, that's, that's your best starting point to really get around the, the, the basic um, in basic day-to-day uh, -day tools that you'll be using in Isolde. So uh, a little bit on getting started uh, with, a, for example, with a crystal model. So Isolde adds um, some extra open commands to Chimera X. So, so if you want to fetch a crystal model with, its, with maps generated from its structure factors straight from the PDB, just open PDB ID structure factors true, will give you that map, uh, give you the model and map ready to go. Uh, if for, for your own model, you have two choices. You can either use, uh, for your own model and structure factors that haven't been up, uploaded to the PDB yet, Isolde has a load crystallographic data set button, which will let you load your MTZ uh, file, or the command 
Clipper open um, your MTZ file and the structure model model ID will let you open that against your, your model. Uh, there are some basic rules on MTZ layout. If it does fail on your MTZ file, I'd actually like to know about it. If, if you do run into a file that it, it won't, um, won't open properly because I, I, I do wish to work and, and improve upon that. Um, so let me know. Uh, if you have experimental structure factors, um, so it, as intensities or amplitudes, then that will trigger it to generate what are live maps, so maps that recalculate the, the, in the background as your model changes, as your coordinates, occupancies, B factors change. Um, and any pre-calculated amplitudes and phases in your, in your MTZ file will also be used to generate maps. Um, at the moment, it will just generate one map for everything it finds, and then it's up to you to close the ones that you don't want. Again, at some point, I will add a GUI um, tool to, to actually let you choose exactly which ones you want to open at any one time. But for now, that, that's, that's the approach. And so this is what it looks like. So I, I have a model open. So to, to open structure factors, um, so clipper open, the MTZ file structure model number one. It takes a few seconds in the background there to, um, to actually generate the maps. Um, and then we will see in a second or two, it comes back up with the, its standard visualization. So there we go. Um, and in this case, this MTZ file did have a couple of extra pre-calculated maps. So you go to the models panel and you can find those maps and just hit close and then you're left with just the, the library calculating ones that uh, you'll mostly be working with. Now, an important note for people working with crystallographic data and, and do want to use pre-calculated maps from a different program, Isolde won't know if the crystallographic, if the, if the free reflections have been included in the calculation of those maps. And that's a fairly important thing because if the free reflections are used in the maps, and then you use those maps to, to fit your model, then you are fitting your free set and you're polluting your, um, your cross-validation. So you're, you're, in, you're, effect, you're potentially at least invalidating the use of our work and our free as a validation tool. So for that reason, um, static, those what, what is a uh, term static maps in, in Isolde, uh, disabled by default for, um, for use in simulations and you have to explicitly enable them via the, um, the, the map settings dialog on, on the Isolde GUI. Uh, for the maps that are calculated live from structure factors, the, the maps that you see have the free reflections included, but there's a special map uh, generated specifically for the, the fitting uh, that ex excludes them. So that, that's all, all maintained and kept safe. And I think this is a fairly unusual thing that uh, com compared to other tools, but I, I think fairly important, is that Isolde is absolutely strict about making sure that your model is never exposed to any influence from the, uh, from the free set whatsoever. Um, and I think compared to other model building approaches, it, it's probably important for Isolde to do that because when you have a simulation running, every single atom that is mobile in the simulation is being refitted into your map rather than just the, the small few, res, few atoms or few residues that you're fitting in a, in a different environment. So with the cryo-m model, things are even simpler. So you just open your model and map in camera X. Uh, you can fetch the maps directly from the EMDB if you like, just open, I, open the EMDB number from, from EMDB. Um, and Isolde has a button to associate a real space map with the selected model, or you can use the command if you prefer the command line, clipper associate map ID to model ID will do the same job. And what can be really quite helpful, especially for um, maps that have been over sharpened and are quite noisy, at any time you can generate a smooth or sharpened copy of your cryo map with the Chimerix command volume Gaussian uh, map ID B factor um, and then a B value. 
where the where the positive B factor indicates smoothing, and that. And then you can just re-associate that map with your model as well, and then, then continue using either or both for fitting as you prefer. So Isolde will automatically choose a map weighting, so how strongly the simulations will actually pull on the atoms, or how strongly the map will pull on the atoms in simulations, I should say. Uh, and that it does that by calculating the gradients in the map all, all around every atom in, in your model. But that calculation does assume only a single map. So if you do choose to use multiple maps to pull on the same model, then you may wish to adjust your uh, map weighting down. And you can do all of that by that same map settings dialog on the Zolder GUI. And that's all, all covered in the tutorials. So in terms of general workflow, most of what you'll be doing with your model is going to be using this, just the buttons on the Zolder's rebuild tab and a few, uh, things going on there. Uh, the, up the top there, you have your peptide backbone and rotomer manipulation tools that will just let you, say, flip uh, a peptide bond in, in plane or sister trans and ad adjust uh, a preview and then and adjust uh, rotomers either by setting the coordinates to the new rotomer or applying uh, torsional restraints to smoothly go there. Um, there's some, just some extra convenience tools to extend or shrink a selection along it along the chain. Um, you can apply secondary structure restraints as helix C, helix beta sheet, a beta strand. Uh, you can shift and register, which can be a whole lot of fun. We will actually see an example of that later. Uh, position restraints can be you can add a position restraint to any heavy atom in the simulation. Uh, just by selecting it and then choosing to either pin it to its current position or to the position of your uh, pivot indicator, the, the crosshairs you'll see in the center of the screen um, indicating the center of rotation. Uh, and, inter and distance restraints can also be added between two atoms interactively by this GUI. Now let's actually see a few examples of what all this looks like in action. So. Um, the first one, as I've alluded to already, is that because you're, you're talking about a molecular dynamic simulation, the model is behaving like a real object. So if we take this, for example, and just slow it, slow it down to, to zero Kelvin so we get rid of that thermal jitter and just see what, what's happening. So now things will only move when we tug on them. If we grab an atom and pull, we see it pushes on the other atoms around it and everything pushes back and almost everything just falls back into place on its own. And there's just a few little tweaks to actually needed to, to put things back to where they were. Um, and the next thing, so, so problems that are quite trivial uh, in the sense that they are very local and are just a, a rotation of a torsion here, here and there should take trivial time to fix. And here's a great example of this, this loop here, where if we see it start this thing rotating and just pause it for a second, we can see the, these yellow planes are saying the, these bonds are extremely badly twisted and they're actually almost in cis, except uh, what is older does is it looks for the for these twisted and cis peptide bonds if a bond is in within 30 degrees of cis it will be restrained as such otherwise it's assumed that it is in serious error and is probably actually supposed to be in trans and will restrain it as trans and the the these restraints are quite explicit so that it's impossible to accidentally flip a, a peptide bond from cis to trans or vice versa in as older, you can only do it by um, design. So you have, have the, these twisted peptide bonds here. The C alphas that are colored um, hot pink or orange here are all either very, very marginal or outlying uh, Ramachandran, so that the peptide, the backbone is really badly twisted here. And then you see the, these funny, the exclamation marks with a spiral around them as saying that these are rotomer outliers. So there's a lot of things wrong here. What's really nice about this is that when I hit this oldest play button and actually start it going, almost all of this just falls into place on its own 
within within the space of one frame uh, just by the actions of the, the molecular dynamics energy minimizer. And we're left with really just one rotor mode to fix on our own and then everything is happy and good to go. And then the other thing that the real-time validation makes, does very well, that surprisingly well in fact, that it, is it picks up things that before I had it in place in Isolde, even after years of, of looking at many, many models, I would have gone straight past. And the, the three sidechain outliers here are a really good example in that by eye, none of these look particularly wrong. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't look, then they're not clashing with anything. They, they seem reasonably stable, but according to the mole probability statistics calculated from tens of thousands to even in some cases, millions of the of side chains from uh, very high resolution structures, these are extreme statistical outliers, uh, well below 0.1% so, and almost certainly wrong. And indeed, if we come through these and just for each one of them in turn, just dial up um, alternative rotomers, we find that all of them actually, we have now have three uh, very high probability rotomers that actually fit the data slightly better than before. So um, now just to give um, a, a picture of application of Isolde from what I've been doing ever since we've, we've been locked down at home here, I figured, um, uh, especially because I do have two young kids and actual coding is a little bit harder at home than it is in a nice quiet office, I've been decided that one of the things I can do is just use this tool set to try and curate and improve upon all the, the flood of uh, COVID-19 structures that have been coming out over the past uh, month or two in the PDB. And it, uh, it, there's a few examples, if anyone's been following me on Twitter, you'll know all about these already, but um, a few examples for, from some of the things I found. So first one here, um, actually, uh, so NSP12, so this is the, um, RNA uh, dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, turns out that the C terminal helix of the, of the main chain is out of register by a full nine residues. And over here we can see, as it is in the original um, model, you see here, for, for example, this threonine with an enormous density blob beside it that, that's saying very clearly that this side chain is far too small for what the, the map density is saying. Um, turns out that this is just inherited from the earlier SARS structures of the same complex, which were solved also, also by cryo-EM at a somewhat lower resolution. And th this map is the first one that's high, res high enough resolution to really show it clearly that, th that this is really wrong. And it turns out that it is actually a full nine residues out of register. There's a this proline here look, is very nicely fitted and it should be because there is actually a proline belongs there. It's just another proline that is uh, another nine residues downstream. And so on the next um, screen, we'll see the, the um, application of as old as register shifter, which just essentially tugs the backbone atoms along a spline um, through, the, through the coordinates but to, to bring, bring the model smoothly from one position to another without ever risking the introduction of clashes that you then have to deal with. And if we go in here now, we see after that nine residue shift, everything suddenly makes perfect sense in that density. Um, and actually the, this week on the PDB, there were two new models of this complex released. Um, one very, very similar to 7BTF, the, the complex in the APO form and the other one in complex with RNA and the drug, the nucleotide analog drug remdesivir. And both of those have the same error in them that, um, that needed to be corrected as well. So moving forward, another one, so 6M17, uh, this is a receptor binding domain in complex with, uh, it, the, uh, so the spike protein receptor binding domain in complex with its human um, target, the uh, um, acetylcholine esterase 2, and 
B081, which I, I'm not quite as familiar with. It's a neutral amino acid transporter that interacts with ACE2. It's, it has many good things about it, but it, it, it is a good illustration of what's turning out to be a really quite common problem lately. And that, to the point where I'm half convinced it's something systematic uh, coming in somewhere where uh, N-linked sugars are being uh, added to the sugar backwards. So they're, they're flipped 180 degrees around the, the bond to the asparagine from where they should be. And that's leading to some extremely strange geometry in the deposited refined coordinates where, for example, this one, this bond is almost, has become almost linear when it should be a, a nice uh, sort of near 120 degree um, angle. That does unfortunately at the moment mess with chimera X's at H to, to add hydrogens for simulation because it, for this sort of bond, it tries to guess the chemistry from the geometry. And if the geometry is really badly wrong like this, it gets the chemistry wrong and doesn't add hydrogens there. So the fixes for that are currently a bit fiddly. Um, I am working on an automated tool for that, but that's not in progress yet. But if you do run into trouble where your simulation can't start because it doesn't recognize a residue, it's quite possible that this is, this is a sort of problem. You won't run into these problems for, for pure nucleic acid or protein, only for um, ligands and bonds between ligands and protein. Another minor but important example, I think, oh, sorry, small but important example, that mistakes can really happen in high resolution structures as well. So this is 6VYO, which is a nuclear capsid phosphoprotein RNA binding domain. And here we have a zinc binding site. So we see the zinc at the bottom here is really nicely coordinated against two histidines and an acid. But then we have this second blob above it, which is clearly, there is clearly something there and something much, much bigger than a water molecule. But it's been modeled as zinc and zinc makes absolutely no sense there. There's nothing there to stabilize it and a ZN2 plus against another ZN2 plus like that, they would, they don't want to be within a million miles of each other. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there is uh, anomalous diffraction data here as well that confirms that that absolutely is not zinc. And what it is, of course, is simply a chloride anion. And in, it, the, the, the strength of its binding at, at, at a, what is quite a low concentration of chloride suggests that it probably is actually a physiologically relevant um, site. And, and another small example of the same sort of problems in a fairly high resolution structure in 6VWW, the NSP15 endoribonuclease. We have this magnesium modeled in a fairly tight site, which is not a magnesium. Uh, the, the really big giveaway here is the peptide backbone amide that's pointing directly at it. Magnesium with a plus two charge, a slightly positive plus charge from the amide. And for, for that matter, an arginine side chain pointing at it over here. That, that doesn't make physical sense again. And actually, if you just replace that with a water and then look at the hydrogen bonding, everything makes absolutely perfect sense. And that, that's, uh, both, both of those, I think, are really good illustrations for why the full molecular dynamics environment can be really useful here, because it is mo trying to model the real physics of this, of your model. It won't let you do things that, that break physics, that, that, that go against physics. These things will want to push themselves out of position and won't want to stay in the density where you've put them because they don't belong there. And that they, they're giving you a very good sign that, that something else should be in this, in this site. A couple of uh, older models. So at the moment, NSP13, there is no uh, COVID-13. Uh, sorry, COVID-19, NSP-13 solved yet, but there are structures of this guy from six from uh, SARS and MERS. But both of them are fairly old, fairly low resolution crystal data and have some fairly severe modeling problems in them. And, but this, this uh, it turned out to be a really nice um, use for some of as old as new tools for, for reference model restraints. Because if we look at the C, C terminal domain of 6JYT, that what's pictured here, 
the density here is extremely weak compared to the rest of the model. And, and, the, and the, the, the actual model here has suffered quite badly for it. The, everything has drifted well away from what is, what is correct. But if we look at 5WWP, uh, the, the MERS um, structure of the same uh, complex, uh, the same protein, that's actually really quite well resolved there. So um, now 5WWP is a three angstrom model and 6JYT is 2.8. But what I did was rebuilt uh, 5WWP. In, uh, well, I rebuilt the whole thing, but then I used that C terminal domain from from 5WWP to restrain both the distance, uh, atom atom distance network, and the torsions, uh, backbone and sidechain torsions of the 6JYT for this domain, and then settle them into the maps. And that, again, this is quite a bit faster than real time. This is using um, uh, Chimerix's movie record, which simply records a snapshot every time the display changes and then plays it back at 30 frames a second. So it's, it's faster than reality. But what I've done here, um, if I come back a little bit, uh, is first just overlaid um, the 5WWP uh, in cyan for visual reference, and it, that, which isn't actually necessary for applying the restraints, but it's nice to, to be able to see what you're doing. Um, and then we're going to add that um, distance restraint network looks like that. There's, um, what's going on here is these are what's known as adaptive distance restraints. So when the, the distance is close to the target, they'll pull strongly. Uh, but as they deviate further and further away, they'll start to stretch and essentially give up and stop pulling strongly. So the ones in green that are very thick are, are the ones that are pulling very strongly. The ones that are in purple and very thin are stretched beyond the point where they uh, want to pull anymore, so the the applied force is very very weak now. And we've applied torsion restraints there as well. You'll, you'll see what they look like coming up in a bit. And so now what we can do is hide all the restraints that have that are actually satisfied, so that we can focus on just the ones that aren't, and then get in there and see what needs to be done to fix them. So for example, here we have this lysing side chain that is in, on entirely the wrong side of the facing chain. So I can pull that into place. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just stop here so that we can see. So all, the, all of these rings around each, each bond here are the, the illustration of these, the adaptive torsion restraints, so the, uh, restraining this model to the 5WWP equivalent. So those are only applied to residues that are actually the same in each model, of course. And they, they, they're designed so that, um, that there are actually two posts on this ring that the angle between those posts are, are telling you how far it is from its target and the color is, is telling you whether it's satisfied or not. So over on the right here we can see this purple one that is far from satisfied for example. So over here we have a um, tryptophan that was flipped all the way out into space. Um, and just in the course of recording this video the R factor is dropped by about half a percent, which was a pretty good sign it was on the right track. There's still quite a bit of tidying up to do. But after, after refinement of that, the R factors were about 2% lower than, than before. So very happy with that result. Um, and just a summary of, well, most of the structures I've worked on so far, um, for uh, the, the COVID-19 structures I've worked on so far, well, COVID-19, SARS and MERS actually are all combined in here. So here we have on the y-axis the mole probity score, the blue bar is the, the model as deposited to the PDB, and the orange bar is after I've been through it with Isolde and then uh, refined with Phoenix Refine. Uh, so uh, um, really the only take home message here is that the, the Isolde mole probity score is consistently lower. Now the lowest possible mole probity score is 0 0.5, the, the score in general the, the idea behind the score in the first place was that the score should be roughly equivalent to the resolution of the model. I think these days we can actually do a whole lot better than that. But in general, a, a score around one is what you would expect of, of a one angstrom resolution model. And I was particularly happy here actually for, with 
one XAK where I, I got the perfect mole probability score, exactly 0 0.5. Um, so that, that means a zero clash score uh, and uh, no, and the no Ramachandran and Radomir outliers. And well, more, more than no Ramachandran and, and Radomir outliers, um, not even any, well, less than 2% uh, backbone uh, so of amino acids in the non-favored Ramachandran space, and 98% or more than 98% favored. Anyway, uh, moving on. So, so one thing that's up and coming for the next version of Isola, which hopefully be in, in a few weeks time. So new commands that I've been using quite heavily for these, uh, this Isolda add water and Isolda add ligand, which let you, as you might suspect, finally actually add waters and ligands to your structure. The addition of ligands is still a bit rough in that it doesn't attempt to do any sort of uh, rough fitting to the density before you actually bring it into the simulation or let the simulation handle it. Uh, but I'll show you what it looks like coming up. Um, but it will add, add, the, add the water or the ligand at the current center of rotation and automatically assign chain ID and B factors according to what's, what's nearby. Uh, that, one thing that Isolde doesn't do at the moment is any sort of refinement of B factors. That's hopefully coming well. What we're working on um, bringing in an interface to Phoenix, probably both for, for things like B factor refinement and for, for rough fitting of, of ligands prior to, prior to simulation, that's going to be a bit more, bit more work down the track. So here's an example of just adding waters. Again, this is slightly faster than real time. Uh, there, with each water, there is a, a couple of seconds because a seconds delay. Because what happens is that you add the water, and that automatically triggers a very the start of a very local uh, simulation to just settle that into place according to the the MD force field. So um, keep that in mind when watching this. But the, what's really nice about this uh, and about the MD in general is that I find it's really good for for dropping waters into even positions that are, are quite weak in the density, but uh, clearly makes sense in terms of the, the physical environment. And at the same time, it's very good at preventing you from being overly optimistic in placing waters where they really don't belong. Because if you try to place a water into a density blob that doesn't make physical sense for a water, it will just push that water out into space and tell you quite clearly, clearly that that does not belong there. And so then you can go ahead and delete that that one and, and try something else. So here we are adding adding a few waters. So in this this is in a in a Crowley map. Uh, this this was the um, six VW six VW no uh, sorry seven seven BV two the, the new um, uh, uh, RNA polymerase uh, structure with the remdesivir, which was good enough resolution to add about 70, 70 waters. So it was really quite nice. Um, adding a simple ligand, so here add a sulfate to the blob, same general idea. This is, of course, in a, in a crystal map. So, th so those sort of things are really quite easy. And so on the subject of ligands, Isolde currently supports about 15,000 of the more common ligands in the PDB. Uh, novel ligands are still a bit more problematic. Um, Work, we're working on a pipeline for that. Uh, you, the, the difficulty is here because it's an MD environment, you need a full amber parameterization for those ligands. Uh, Phoenix Elbow can help with that these days, but then they, those parameters need to be converted to the OpenMM format needed um, for Resolder. And we're currently working on getting a pipeline in place for you. If you do have a situation in the, that you're really desperate to get get working with is older, just shoot me an email. I can give you some some instructions that, that go beyond. Needs a tiny tiny amount of, of of scripting on your part, but not no no big challenge. Um, so for a little bit more complex now, so this is still in some ways quite rough. It's it's absolutely workable, but it's nowhere near as good as I would like it to be. But I will show it just to show you that that it is possible to, to work with docking really big ligands 
or, or it will be once this new version comes out. Um, and this is this is one of the things that I really do want to plug into Phoenix for probably one of the first things um, uh, to do is to use its tools to uh, to actually give you that initial um, uh, docking of, of the residue into the density. But here, um, what I've done is, is picked a, a fairly recent structure with an, with a nice big ligand in it, remove the ligand, and then we'll see how we can go ahead and actually add that back in. So here we are. Um, so a nice big green density blob. So this is a crystallographic map, of course. Nice, really strong difference density. So uh, first thing to do in a situation like this is turn off the live crystallographic map calculations. It's what I just did over there. Sorry, I've just come back to the start of the video by accident. So turn off your live crystallographic map calculations because addition of the ligand it would otherwise trigger a recalculation with the ligand in entirely the wrong place and really mess up your visualization. So keeping, keeping the, the map static for the time being is definitely the way to go here. Then we go ahead and say is all the add ligand D3R for the record. And you can see that ligands in, as I said, entirely the wrong place. But to make it easier to see, we can go ahead and color that in a different um, uh, color. You can do that via the, the GUI buttons as well, but I just did that by command. And then what we're going to do next, is, so this is all the ignore command. I just did Isolde ignore tilde cell basically tells Isolde that for the next sim for for any simulations it does just exclude all of the everything but the actual ligand from simulation so the ligand is now going to be running in the simulation in isolation you'll still be able to see the other atoms but the ligand will pass straight through them so all of the clashes as such don't matter but trying to actually fit this through all of this forest of atoms is going to be a bit of a challenge. So the first thing I'd recommend doing in a situation like this is pick a few key atoms like this sulfonate ester and pick where you think they're going to be. So in this case, it's, it's sort of out on the end of an arm. And then over here you have this um, backbone amide pointing nicely at it. So it's a nice hydrogen bonding. So it makes perfect sense. So we'll place a pin there to, to say a, a position restraint to say this is where we think that's going to be. And then pick a few other, other things like the, this big, well, tryptophan looking um, thing up here that's it's probably going to be up the top there. Pick a few pins, put them there. And one more for, for its tip. You only need two or three of these usually. And then we go ahead and select the ligand and press uh, well, the one more thing I'm going to do is hide everything but the protein C alphas so that we don't have to look through all of these atoms to really figure out what we're doing. Then we'll select the protein and go ahead and hit play. And you see almost immediately during the minimizer, most of that's actually settled in place. And then we can go ahead and just interactively tug and, and try to get the rest fitted. See how we go. Like so. And once we're happy with that, that rough fit, we can then go ahead and release those pins. So with the whole ligand selected, just hit that red X beside the pin buttons and that's released. When we hit, when we hit stop on the simulation, despite the fact that uh, the live, sim, live map calculations are turned off, stopping the simulation still triggers a map recalculation. So now we can see that's happily fitted. Now we turn those live recalculations on. We do is older tilde ignore to stop ignoring everything, to reinstate everything for simulation. And then we can just press, do one more little simulation with everything in place this time to actually fully settle. And there we have a nicely fitted ligand ready, ready to move forward. And that, that uh, video was, was captured real time. So that, that's about as long as it takes you um, for, for one, once you've had a little bit of practice. Um, and with that, I will just go, go on to the acknowledgements. So the, the Chimerics team are very, very wonderful people to work with. Honestly, anyone who's doing development in structural biology and wants a, a really beautiful and flexible front end 
to work with, I, I highly recommend talking to them. Um, the structure factor calculations and symmetry handling is all based on uh, the Clipper library from Kevin Cowton and the, the um, and has evolved from the, the Clipper Python um, bindings. Um, the molecular dynamics is driven by OpenMM, which comes from Stanford and Peter Eastman in particular there. All the peptide um, Ramachandran random validation uh, is from the, the, the uh, excellent work of the, the Richardson lab in, in really collating and uh, analyzing huge data sets of existing structures. Um, the handling of sugars is based on the glycam force field from um, Robert Wood's group. And well, privateer isn't there yet. It's, it's, a, it's a plan on the drawing board, but John Aguirre is uh, very, very keen to actually get that into Isolde for, for, validation, for full validation of sugars. The 15,000 or so ligands that are available uh, in, within Isolde are from work, the work of Nigel Moriarty and David Case, from, Nigel Moriarty from the Phoenix team and David Case from Amber and then the whole Phoenix team in general. And then a growing list of crystallographers and other structural biologists who have really um, been helpful uh, along the way. And of course, the, the Reed Lab as, as my main hosts. And with that, I'll stop and be very, very happy to take any questions that people have. Great, thank you very much. That was a, a, a great talk. And it, there, there are many questions, so. <laughs> Okay, okay. Yep. Uh, so, I guess what, one question, several questions have focused on hardware support. So, do you know does how does Isolde work with stereo, either the the, the um, glasses or with with VR or possibly even with the upcoming haptic feed? Um, so, VR uh, VR is a big focus of Tom Goddard on the Chimerics team. There is a basic implementation of Isolde for VR, which I've played with very, very briefly, or, um, so that, that is courtesy of Tom Goddard. Unfortunately, I don't have my own VR headset to actually do development work on yet, so I haven't been able to do much with it. But for, from the bit I played with it, it, it is very, really quite fun and addictive. Um, uh, 3D glasses, as far as I'm aware, aren't really supported by Camera X at the moment. There is there is some support in there, but I'm not sure if it's actually working at the moment. That, but that would be a question for them, not not specifically for me. That's it's, it's purely a, a Camera X question. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, come to think of it, the stereo glasses might break some of my mouse tugging code because it has to decide which eye is you're looking down to actually pick an atom. Um, but anyway. That, that, yeah, uh, we, we, I'll try to find out. I don't know for sure. But most people probably don't have stereographics set up in their backyard anymore and they have a super. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those on and on again, off again things. It seems to be well and truly off again at the moment. So it's, it's a VR is, a VR is the way things seem to be going yeah. in terms of stereo. So was there another part of that question? I uh, no, that, that was that was a three-part question, and I think uh, haptic feedback. But it sounds like that's possibly so, Chimera X and possibly. Uh, well, no. So my original um, implementation of this sort of approach actually was all based around haptic feedback, uh, the the old Novent Falcon, and I did actually build a support for that in Azolder early on. And it's currently lapsed because, let's face it, the Falcon isn't made anymore and other devices are a little bit rare. Um, but I could reinstate it if there is, if there is interest. Um, yeah. Hard hardware support is always, always yeah. challenging. Yeah. yeah. So uh, moving on to the next question, one of, one of your initial slides had a graph showing mole probity score versus masked CC. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the question was, what is the green dashed line at around 1.5? Uh, oh, so, yeah. so the green, well, that, that's essentially the score we'd like to be at, the, the mole probability score of, that you'd expect from a one and a half angstrom model. So a, a mole probability score of around one and a half is generally, you, you're talking that there's maybe 
one or two or or even no real problems left. The, the, most of your model is is likely to be about right. So that, that that's essentially all that that dashed line is showing. It's where we want to be. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you, you talked a, a bit about resolution limits. Are yeah. do you have any recommended resolution limits for adding water or ligands to cryo EM maps? It's, it, it really boils down to can you see them? Um, so uh, I, I would say I have seen some three angstrom maps where I've been able to, con uh, to, to be confidently add some waters. Beyond that, beyond about three angstroms, I haven't seen any, any real, uh, real cases as, as far as I'm aware. Um, but that, that being said, it, it depends. You see some three, three angstrom resolution maps are the, where everything is really strong and clear and, and low noise and, and you can add them. And then there are others where there, is, there are just no clear signs at all. Um, that being said, there are situations where I found that it can actually pay to add the occasional water, even if there isn't a whole lot of density there, where it just actually makes sense structurally and, and helps the side chain stay in position where, where uh, you'd expect, where you would expect the water to be, but you can't see it. It, it, it can actually help improve the structure. But, but then you, you have to make the decision, do I actually keep that when I deposit it or do I delete those um, prior to final deposition because they're not actually there in the data. Yeah, and so yeah. I, I was the debate about are you trusting the, the chemical information or the experimental yeah. information or both? Yeah. And yeah. That's, that, that gets into deep questions. Yes, yes. So there have been a, a couple of questions about the various types of, of support for modeling. So for our, our nucleic acids or uh, let me, high mannose glycans issues for? Uh, yes, uh, so yes to both, they are supported. There is no validation for them yet. Um, so, that, I mean, they, they will behave themselves really quite well according to the molecular dynamics force field. But there, there's nothing like the, the, the protein ramatrand and rhythm of validation. Uh, that can be a particularly problematic for sugars because they are such complex little beasts in, in terms of the, the ring, every, every, almost every carbon in the rings is chiral and the ring geometry can be hard to actually recognize uh, what, what's real and what's not. And so it is, it is possible, especially if you start getting a little bit aggressive about tugging sugars around to flip the rings into funny conformations. There, so there, there is more work to be done in, in, in adding restraints to those and adding validation, which is for, for sugars, I'd really like to bring in privateer for that reason, because it, it covers both of those, both restraints and, and validation. Uh, for um, RNA, there are validation tools out there, but they are a bit more challenging and very uh, slow as I understand it, because validation nucleic acids is like a 12 dimensional problem, whereas your, your worst rhodomer is like four dimensions. So it's, um, yeah, it, it, so there, there's a bit of extra, extra effort needed to, to bring those in. But yeah, but they, they as, as long as you have good density, um, they, they behave perfectly well. Well, a good density, let, let's say as long as your density for your local resolution for them is, is better than three and a half angstroms or so, they're usually going to be pretty well behaved. Okay, yeah. thank you. I, I, another question. So you, you talked about doing refinement against sharpened maps for EM or for smooth maps. Yeah. Um, is that in, or you talked about Chimera X having sharpened or smooth maps. Is that, does that bring in the same issue that you sometimes have with refinement against sharpened or smooth crystallographic amplitudes? Uh, what sort of problems are you talking about? Uh, uh, th there, there have been some cases that, that where I've seen people debating that, you know, a low resolution crystal structure we sharpen the, the the experimenters sharpen the amplitudes and then refine against those sharpened amplitudes and deposit that model. 
Do you think that's something that is necessarily a concern for this? Yeah, country? well, yeah, I think it's, it's, I think it's a bit of an open question in the Crowleyan world exactly what to do in, in those situations. Um, the, the, I think people are, are still debating exactly how, how, which map you should do your final refinement against because, well, let, let's face it, it's a little bit harder to say what is the true level of sharpening you should do in a cryo-m map, I think. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it, at the moment, I mean, in many cases, I find it, it's, th things behave really quite well just by, well, what I tend to do for visualization purposes as much as anything is have the one map at the, at the deposited sharpening level, whatever that happens to be. And then add a second map as a wireframe on top of that. So you've got the, the transparent surface for the sharpened map and then a, a smoother map as a wireframe and a lower contour. And but let both of those actually pull on the model in the simulation. Um, and things tend to, in terms of confirmation geometry, things are, are very well behaved. Now, when it comes to doing things like refining B factors against those things, that's where things become really a little bit weird. If you, depending on the sharp level of sharpening you choose, your B factors are going to be completely different. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that, that, that goes back to does, yeah. the title of the slide you have on screen, low resolution model building is hard. I think everybody who's tried that can, can very much agree yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we had another question about uh, for the, the N-linked sugar issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is just to clarify, the problem bond was between the, the ASN and the sugar? Yes. Is yes. that currently an issue with all molecule ligand bonds? Um, no, so no, that wasn't Isolde that did that. That that's the model as it was deposited. Ah, looks okay. like that. Yes, um, and the problem it raises for Isolde is that you um, you need to have correct hydrogens on your model before you can simulate it. Um, but Chimerix gets the hydrogens wrong because the geometry is bad, so you can't simulate it to improve the geometry to get the hydrogens right. It's a chicken and egg problem. Um, so yes, I, I'm working on on some tools to just set the hydrogens according to the molecular dynamics template regardless of the geometry so that we can actually get things started and moving so that we can settle them properly but yeah but they, they, those problems that 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 problem that you saw there well here i'll bring it up again um where is it uh, that is in the model as it's in the pdb right now that's that's what that looks like and it, it's just completely wrong yeah, the, the starting conditions always, you know, that's that's problematic. And yeah. yeah. How what kind of options are there for defining the local area for refining a solda? Um so okay, so um so what happens by default, so when you press that play button, is it will take whatever atoms you have selected right now. Um, so, and for each of those, it will extend that out to the full res residue. And then for, for things that are in a chain, whether nucleic acid or protein, it will extend back and forwards by three residues. And then take all of that and it will expand outwards by five angstroms and then that's your mobile region. And then there's a fixed shell around that. You can adjust the, the, how that works. There, there are options to adjust how far along each chain it goes and how far outwards it goes, but that um, usually works well just with those default settings. But beyond that, you, you can choose anything from one atom to the whole model. It really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, a a follow-up question on, the, on map sharpening. Have you, have you tried using any of the, the density modified maps from, from Phoenix Resolve in, not, in what they sold it? Not personally yet. I think they'll work just fine. The, um, but no, I, I haven't I, yet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Th there's always more things to do than there is time to do them at. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we've just, just have a few more questions. Um, can can you say anything about how this compares to cryofit? Um, 
Well, it's a very different thing. So the thing about, um, well, about any purely automated method is that, that, well, they are garbage in, garbage out. If you have a, re if you have a good model in, in one confirmation and your map is in a new confirmation and you just want to refit it, cryofit will do a really good job most of the time. If your starting model is bad, it's just going to give you a new bad model that is fitted to your new map, but, but the model is still bad. Um, the, the, it's the question of um, the, the, the detail versus the, the overview, I, I guess. The, I don't know of any, any automated method that really fixes a lot of the, these really nitty gritty, gritty details that are important. I, it, may, it may also be a case where there's, there, there's always a trade-off between you, you need to have human judgment to actually make the decision versus yeah. if you have a completely automated system, then it's completely unbiased. And you, which, which one of those is appropriate depends on what, what you're refining. Well, yes. And uh, yes, yeah, so it, and it, yeah, it depends on exactly um, what your situation is. But there, there are many tools you can you can use to to do that, those really bulk shifts to, to to refit your model. But at some point, you still need to get in there and actually inspect for yourself to all the, to make sure the details have, have been gotten right. So that that's that's really what is is for. Okay. I mean, you can do the big bulk fits in Isolde as well if you want to. Um, at the, um, that, with, especially with the, those those new uh, distance restraints, help help with that a lot. But it it's yeah, it, it's really primarily about getting the details right. And what what I believe is our last question is: Have have you deposited your improved COVID models anywhere? Um, yeah. So I. If you go to my Twitter, Kroll Tristan, and look at my pinned tweet, uh, there is a link to a Google Drive which has all of them. There is, they are also in uh, the GitHub uh, repository organized by Andrea Thorne called the Coronavirus Structural Task Force, which is trying to pull together all the structural information uh, about the coronavirus in, in, under one roof. Um, so those those are in the tree. Just search for for directories called as older, and you'll find them in there as well. Uh, I've tried to contact as many of the authors of the original models that I've changed substantially as well to see if I can get them just to to update their coordinates in the PDB. I've had varying success with that. Some of them have, many of them haven't. Um, and probably at some point I'll I'll turn all of this into a preprint, and for the ones that haven't been updated in the PDB, I'll just deposit them under new IDs. But, well, yeah, that that's a longer term thing. Ah, and we have one one final question that, that snuck in. Yeah. Um, so if, if if someone wanted to refine or correct a full ribosome model, what would you recommend for the strategy to do that? Would that be like one one chain at a time or full model in one map? Um, yeah, well, you, you can open the full model in one map, no problem at all, especially with the latest version of Chimerics. That used to be that used to be really slow because Chimerics's cartoon redrawing was really slow. So every time you started a simulation, you'd have like half a minute wait um, just to redraw the cartoon. But they've uh, improved that massively now. So having having large models is no problem at all now. Um, but yes, generally I, I would just say go through chain by chain. Uh, I haven't really mentioned that, but the, the, so a, a nice way to do that. Um, so Chimerics has a command sequence chain and then the chain ID will, will bring up the, the sequence. You can make a selection and then you on, on the, on that sequence and then you can say view that selection and go there. So you can take yourself to the start of a chain and then work your way, way through it that way. And that can be a, a nice straightforward way to, to get through the whole model. And especially for things like ribosomes, I would actually recommend going through each protein chain end to end because I have seen so many ribosome models where some of the some of the protein chains are really badly out. So they, they um, so it is worth getting in there with that fine tooth comb. 
And for, for reference, I mean, I've been through, uh, well, I don't know, um, since, since, since the, the whole COVID-19 epidemic started, I, I've probably looked at, looked directly residue by residue at somewhere to, between 20 and 30,000 residues now. Um, and you, you can get through, uh, so that in, in, at least in a, in a decent map, say, say better than 3S in resolution, you can get through five to 10,000 residues in a day if, if, you're, if you're quick and the model isn't too terrible. Because let's face it, most of the model is just fine. So it, 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 going through that is not, not such a daunting task. And here, here in Cambridge, I've been helping a, a student with his um, with a, a new mitochondrial complex that, that's a, about 1.2 megadolsons. Um, and that's actually been mostly built starting from homology models in the Zolder itself. And yeah, it's, it's all doable now. It, it's worth going for it. All right, great. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying after our allotted time to answer all, all the questions from the audience. No all, all the folks who've joined in, thank you very much for joining in. And we look forward to seeing you at future seminars. So thank you. Well, thank you.